Hello, friends, and welcome to the April 22nd edition of Weekly Witness, Texas Impact's weekly opportunity for mainstream Texans of faith to learn about public policy issues here in the great state of Texas and have a conversation about how you can engage in the process. My name is Scott Adnip, your host and Texas Impact's Outreach Director, and today's episode is being brought to you by Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas. And today we're going to be talking about voting. But before we do that, I want to take just a moment to thank all of the congregations and faith leaders who are doing your part in the midst of this crisis. Those who are encouraging members to stay home and finding new ways to be in worship, uh, to worship and be in ministry together. Uh, for those who are supporting first responders and all those frontline workers who are doing the important work uh, necessary to keep our society going and all of those who are finding creative ways to meet the new and unprecedented needs of our local community. So just want to start out by saying thank you. Uh, You are doing incredible work. Um, While all that is going on, in the midst of all that, elected officials are trying to figure out what in the world to do. And so they need faith communities, they need faith leaders to communicate with them about what you're experiencing and how you recommend that they can best meet the needs in our local communities. Uh, So this is an important moment. We need faith communities and faith leaders to step up. It's also a perfect time for y'all to sign up to be a part of Texas Impact's Rapid Response Team or legislative engagement groups. And you can find more information about that on our website at texasimpact.org or by reaching out to me directly at scott at texasimpact.org. So, uh, All of that aside, uh, today we are going to be talking with one of our regulars on Weekly Witness, uh, Grace Shemaine, who is president of the League of Women Voters. Grace, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm happy to be here. And we were just talking before we started recording. This is our 99th episode, and you've been on now at least three or four times, so I think it's very regular. Woohoo! Who's going to be on the 100th? That's what I want to know. Oh, you'll have to tune in. We're going to be recording a special episode very soon. Uh, oh, that'll be fantastic. And offering some reflection. So, so keep an eye out for that in the coming days. Um, so first of all, uh, how are you doing and how are you adjusting to this new reality? Well, we thought oh, the biggest election in years is coming up, the 2020 elections. We got this. We're, we're going. We got it. There's some changes coming. We were ready to educate voters on when to vote and, ha- and about what candidates are saying with the voter's guide. We were ready with educating voters on straight ticket voting and, and no more straight ticket voting. And then what happens? Boom, the coronavirus hits. <laughs> and suddenly we have to back step, uh, you know, backtrack and go, all right, what is most important now? And how can we be helpful to uh, all the 254 counties, the election administrators, the Secretary of State, and especially helpful for the voters of Texas so they can participate in the elections and and help support our democracy. So let's start with, you mentioned the fact that we have an election coming up, and and most listeners' mind will turn to November because we can't turn on our television our social media without being reminded that there's an election coming in November. Uh, but we have an election in Texas before that, right? So so what are we voting on and when are we voting next? Okay, so remember back uh, earlier in February and March, we voted in the, um, oh, what was? The primary elections? The primary elections. We voted in the primary election. And it was really exciting, and everybody got to vote and participate. Well, after the primary election, if uh, one of the uh, candidates didn't get more than 50% of the votes cast, then the first and second candidate have to be in a runoff. So we have some very important elections coming up called the run the the primary runoff elections, and that's coming up on July 14th. And so we want people to participate in that election because if they don't, then such a few people choose who's going to run in the November election. And sometimes there's no, nobody else even on the other ticket. So it's really important that everybody participate in the uh, primary runoff. Otherwise, you know, it's how our democracy works is the more people vote, the better candidates we're going to get. 
Yeah, so it is important that everybody votes, but it's also important that we stay safe. That's right. So we've been, everybody has been inundated with information about uh, the importance of not being around groups of people and trying to stay home. Uh, so I know our listeners are passionate about voting and we want to make sure that people can do it safely. And so what the, the, the safest way to vote in these circumstances, I would assume, would be to vote by mail. So under the current law, as it is today, who is eligible to vote by mail? So currently, though it is in litigation uh, and we're trying to expand it, but currently, really the people who are over 60 or who are 65 years and older qualify for year round vote by mail. People who are sick and disabled qualify for year-round vote by mail. And so we want to encourage all of those people to vote by mail. The other people who could sign up if they're out of the, the county during early voting and election day, or if they're eligible to vote but they're in jail, then they could also uh, sign up for, for one election. Uh, so the people who really qualify are 65 years and older, sick and disabled, and what does that mean? And that's kind of what the trick is right now. Yeah. Because according to what we would hope uh, as a league and many other groups would want everybody to know that during this pandemic, everybody's at risk for getting the coronavirus. And so we would hope that if we could open it up to everybody to vote by mail. But right now, just... Uh, those particular groups and so we want everybody in those groups to go ahead if they can and if they want to to apply now to uh, with their county uh, early voting election administrator and apply now to uh, get an application to vote by mail. So let me ask a question. Uh, obviously we all know if we're 65 or older that doesn't, right. that doesn't take a lot of math to figure out right? Uh, but how, what is the current guidance on what defines a disability? So, so from the secretary, I've talked with the secretary of state's, uh, folks and, and, uh, we put it on our website and let me read it to you because that's the legal thing. And then I'm going to talk to you about it. And it defines disability to include a sickness or physical condition that prevents the voter from appearing at a polling place on election day without the likelihood of needing assistance or or injuring the voters health and so what this means is if you have a condition some type of condition that would be impacted severely by the coronavirus then we would encourage you to vote by mail conditions I'm going to go ahead and list some and as a nurse I know some people who are on treatment for cancer and their immune system is depressed, people who have immune system problems, people who have uh, any type of physical disability that makes it harder to breathe, people who have asthma, who have high blood pressure, people who have uh, chronic obesity, uh, people, people who are on medications that make it uh, their immune system suppressed, those people especially and I'm sure there's many, many more people who have seizures uh, that would be impacted with the high fevers that come along, people who have emphysema. I mean, as a retired nurse, I could just expand on that. So I want you to think to yourselves, who in your congregations, who do you know in your life, who would be impacted by the coronavirus that needs to go ahead and avail themselves of this type of voting, which is to apply to vote by mail. If you are at this moment, unless the lawsuits work, at this moment, people who are healthy and do not have any physical problems should not apply to vote by mail. But I feel like I and maybe we want to stress that if you're over 65 or in one of those disabled categories, you absolutely should apply as soon as possible. Even if you feel like you're not at risk, uh, we can argue about that. Uh, but the fewer people, the more people we have voting by mail, the fewer people who will be standing in long lines on election day. 
way. So think of other people, right? Yeah, think of, think of the people who are actually the, the, the heroes who are going to be uh, the poll workers and the election judges. I mean, those people are going to be ex exposed, and we're encouraging the uh, election administrators to use the CDC guidelines out lightens on that and we're also encouraging people to to sign up to be poll workers and election workers if they're really healthy and they feel like they can uh, and then the voters who have to stand in those lines if there's a long line six feet apart covering their mouth uh, maybe wearing gloves uh, those are the things we would encourage and then uh, you know sanitizing whatever the voting equipment is in your particular county but the best thing to do, if you can vote by mail, then please apply now because that decreases the amount of uh, vi the virus that would may be spread through uh, the election process. It's interesting that you brought up election workers. I, I saw a quote um, recently from the Bear County Elections Administrator that said that 60% of the election officials are over the age of 65. So right. certainly we need more people to, to volunteer to do that. Also, we don't want to put those people at risk, right? That's right. And that's a member, a lot of our members, they, they're definitely poll workers and election judges, and a lot of them don't want to put themselves at risk. So now would be a time for people to think, who who do they know who would be very healthy and could follow those kind of conditions uh, and are willing to be trained to be a poll worker because that is going to be needed in, in this election. So, so we've said a couple of times, apply now, apply now, apply now. Uh, mm -hmm. and we hope everybody will go do that who's eligible. Uh, what is the actual deadline for applying for this next election? So the deadline for the July 14th primary runoff is July 3rd, and, it, and the, applic the application has to be at the early voting election office in your county by the end of the working day. So seriously, apply now, because it just takes a long time for the application to get to you and then to get back to the county. Uh, and then it takes, then you need to get the ballot to you and also back in once you uh, have applied to vote by mail. And, and it's, not, it's not difficult. If you want to get the application to vote by mail, of course we have it on our website, uh, but you could get it from your county election officials or from the Texas uh, Secretary of State, which is at tex texasvotes.gov, uh, and you could go there and get the application mailed to you. So we just want to encourage as many people as possible to, to do this now. When you apply, when you are 65 or older or sick and disabled, that means that will go through the whole year. So you'll be able to apply now to vote in the runoff, it will also mean the ballot uh, to vote by mail will be sent to you for the November election. So there you go. So apply now, apply now, apply now. You don't want to get caught up in the rush at the end and want to make sure you have plenty of time to, to have that process. That's right. So we talked earlier this week and Texas Impact is going to be launching a campaign very soon to encourage congregations to recruit vote by mail captains. Uh, who will help eligible voters in your congregation uh, apply to vote by mail or, or encourage them to do so. Uh, so I always find you to be very encouraging uh, for, for people who are interested in voting and encouraging others to vote. Why should congregations organize uh, or mobilize voters to vote by mail? Well, this is a great time to reach out to, to all your congregation. Uh, because they are at home and a lot of them are isolated. And so it's a great time to assign somebody to talk to them and to reach out to them either by email or by regular mail or by telephone and, and talk to them and encourage them to participate in this process to be a part of the democracy. Because I know that people out there want to know 
how they can help uh, their democracy. And this is it. You know how to help the democracy? It's by voting. So let's do it. And I think that uh, churches and, and religious organizations are just the perfect vehicle right now because they know who's out there in their community and they can be encouraging and loving and kind and encourage them to participate in voting in a safe way so they could vote safely at home. We don't want to scare anybody. We just want to say, oh, you're eligible, eligible to vote safely at home. And so we're encouraging you by sending you this application. You could probably get applications from your county election administrator to vote by mail and just hand them, hand them out or send them in the mail. And congregations are being so creative right now with the way they're doing worship and, and doing other mm -hmm. ministry. And I know a lot of congregations are mailing out packets to um, senior members of their congregation who might not get online for worship services and that kind of thing. And how easy would it be to just put one of those vote by mail applications in the packet you're sending out to them? Yeah, so. it'd be great. Oh, can I, can I put one more plug in? Yeah, go for it. I'm going to put a plug in for those uh, members of your congregation that are that are graduating from high school, that are turning 18, it's their first time to register to vote. And you know what? They may not have, uh, a lot of times uh, congregations will send out like a graduation a card. Why don't you slip in a, uh, a voter registration card? Because a lot of people can't, uh, you know, most of the time it happens at school and schools are closed, colleges are closed, libraries are closed. So it's a great time to do that too. Or there's a, a website called registertovote.org where you can have a voter registration card that's all filled out, mailed to you with postage page. So what a great way to do two things. You could help, help your, uh, 65 years and older uh, folks and sick and disabled folks and also the the new voters the voters who would want to vote for the very first time that would be fantastic all right great idea uh we're gonna get real creative today with mailing things <laughs> to everybody uh so grace i want to draw like a, a hard line between the conversation we've had so far where mm -hmm. we want those who are sick and disabled no 65 plus to apply now, yes. uh, but obviously, and the next conversation will be about what we hope will happen. So obviously those over 65 and, and sick and disabled should apply now, but none of us want to go into crowds right now. I mean, I, I certainly don't want to go wait in line for, for hours to vote. I'll, I'll do it if that's what I need to do, uh, mm -hmm. right? But we want to make this as safe as possible for everybody, and we have some 65 plus on here that want to, that are listening that want to make sure their kids and grandkids can vote in as safe a way as possible. So we'd love to be able to open up this opportunity to vote by mail uh, for everyone. Um, right. So it, what do we hope will happen for July? Is that a possibility at all? It is a possibility because there's some lawsuits. The League of Women Voters has joined in the lawsuits and, uh, uh, the Democratic Party is joined with the lawsuits. Uh, I think some other uh, voting rights advocates have joined in a lawsuit trying to get the Secretary of State's office to define disabled to include everybody right now because what, what was that one section that said uh, the likelihood of needing assistance or injuring a voter's health? <laughs> I'm sorry, but the coronavirus seems to be injuring voters, injuring the health of many people around the country, and we don't want to see that impacted by voting. It would be best if more folks can vote safely at home. Vote safely at home. So they can, if they wanted to, do you want me to say where they could, who they could call if they wanted to? I was going to say, so, so what do we do if we want to make that a reality? Our listeners love to get involved. I, well, what we have had people do is contact their elected officials at, at the Capitol, the state Capitol, contact the governor, and contact the Secretary of State's office. So uh, that's what I would do. And I would just make a phone call because we're all bored. Make a phone call. 
You could send emails if you want to, but make a phone call and it really works. It's quick and easy and everybody enjoys talking to another person. Tell them that you would like to have Vote by Mail opened up and so that more people can vote safely at home. Uh, yeah, and, and <laughs> I had a really nice conversation with a staffer a week or two ago. I was actually in a congressional office, but they're working from home too. And so I, I was having this conversation with the staffer and I was like, are y'all working for me? He said, yeah, I'm sitting in my apartment right now. So I guess I gave him something to do that day. I have a little conversation. So absolutely call and talk about the importance of this issue. I also encourage you to, to tweet at them if you're on Twitter. Um, oh. But anything else that we should be thinking in terms of uh, engagement, in terms of advocacy on voting issues? In what I would... What I would do, perhaps, is consider contacting your election administrator for your county and find out to make sure that they're going to be prepared for more vote-by-mail applications because they're, uh, and, and ask them how you could be a, of assistance to them because everybody is stressed right now. And we want to be helpful to the county election officials. We want to be helpful uh, to the county commissioners and the judges, uh, but we want to make sure that they understand how important this, that voting and elections are to us, and that we will not sit idly by while uh, the, the elections pass us by, that we want to participate, and it's up to them to make sure we're allowed to do that. So be of assistance. Ask them how you can help. They may want you to sign up for a committee, maybe if you're healthy enough, and younger, sign up to be a poll, wa poll worker or an election judge or sign up to be the signature committee person or somebody who helps with counting of the uh, vote by mail ballots. It seems especially like those who are young and healthy uh, need to step up this year to take the place of some people who might need to stay home on election day. Is that, is that fair? That, that is fair, and that's one of the things we were talking to the Secretary of State about. And you know, colleges aren't having uh, in-person meetings right now, so maybe colleges can do that. High schoolers are allowed to work as poll workers, too. If you're 16 and above, you could work, uh, I don't know, it may be all high schoolers, but I know for 16 and above, you can be a, a, a poll worker. So. What a great time to be a part of, uh, of the election process and learn how it all works and help out uh, in the election and, help, and let, let some of the older uh, election judges stay home this time and, and be safe. So that's what I would encourage is find out how you can volunteer to help out your county and make sure everybody can uh, participate in voting. Uh, anything else that we should know today or any shameless plugs you'd like to make? Well, as always, the, um, the, voter, the League of Women Voters of Texas and leagues across the state create something called a Voter's Guide, which is a nonpartisan where, uh, Voter's Guide where people can compare candidates. It's at vote411.org. It won't be up until, you know, maybe a couple of weeks before the election on uh, July 14th, but let's go ahead and, uh, and write it down and know where it's at because you want to know who is the best candidate for you to vote for. And, and I'd also highlight uh, the information you have on the website about vote by mail and the upcoming elections. And we'll link uh, sources for applications and all of that when we post this podcast so you can find it. Yeah, one, one other thing. I want to let people know that if you, if you voted in the uh, primary as a Democrat, then you vote in the runoff as a Democrat. If you voted in the primary as a Republican, you vote in the runoff as a Republican. If you did not vote in the, in the primary, you could vote in whichever one you want to. And then in the general election in November, you could vote for absolutely whoever you want to. Right. That's just the way it is, it's democracy. Democracy at its finest. Grace, thank you so much for the time, this was fun. All right. Thanks so much, Scott. Talk to you later. All right. Thanks. And friends, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, remember that we are up and running uh, with a lot of different information on the Texas Impact site. We have a coronavirus specific page with actions alert, action alerts and a lot of different ways that you can get involved. 
And remember uh, that if, if you appreciate the work of Texas Impact and the Weekly Witness community, uh, make sure to support us by becoming a member and make sure that you and your congregation are both members by going to texasimpact.org slash join. Friends, we know these are anxious times, but the world needs communities of faith engaged. So let's get to work.